Okay, um, so this is a um, kind of history lesson and um, uh, partly because some of the subjects that we've covered in the last few weeks have uh, touched on the idea of um, you know, the TPP, the positioning, the kind of messaging, the execution, the stuff that sits around that. And one thing that I'm very aware of is that there's a lot of people who don't know enough about the, um, you know, the great examples that we have from recent history because they seem so old now. And Lipitor is one of those um, products that I think everyone should know something about. Because looking back on it now, the idea that Lipitor is, 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 is a phenomenon, is, is, that's the thing that's been baked into everyone's minds. How it happened and, and, the, and what else might have happened is, uh, is, is, is tends to get lost in the, in the, in the mists of time. So, um, uh, let's go back through that and think about you know Lipitor at its peak, at its peak, uh, sales was bigger than Pfizer was before they bought Lipitor. Um, so you know the, the idea that one drug can change a company. Well, it literally changed the company in the case of Warner Lambert, Park Davis, um, but also changed Pfizer into a different kind of company. Um, so we need to really look at what, uh, what, what goes on there. So, and it's been interesting because I've gone back to, uh, we did uh, a lot of research. Um, we do a lot of research really to understand path to market and, uh, and success stories. We weren't involved in Libertor, um, and I wish I had been. So we went back to um, really pretty much interview most of the people who've been around at the time of, uh, of, of launch uh, of, of, of Libertor and to really examine some of the decisions that were taken in the path to market uh, and so forth. So a lot of these slides are old slides from an old case study and it's been really interesting going back to kind of understand that, uh, that, that, that story. So um, apologies for the, um, for the, for the, for the slides. Um, we haven't rebuilt them to, to, to kind of refresh the story a little bit. So just going to go back through this history lesson. Um, this iPad has got some um, uh, of the, the slides and again if you'd like any of them just email me mike at ideafarmer.com uh, and, uh, and I can get the slides to you if you want uh, to use them in your own uh, live streaming so a brief timeline you see it goes up to like 1996 and it says there's an awful lot happened within the world of cholesterol uh, going all the way all the way back then but um, again in this kind of history lesson I think it's important to remember that um, um, in the 1970s and the 1980s, there was a lot of debate about the idea of reducing cholesterol, and there was a you know a lot of concern about does reducing cholesterol cause harm? You know, lots of considerations that it could cause cancer if you went too low, uh, and that there may be a violent death and suicide risk uh, associated with, um, with 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 lowering cholesterol. So you know, all the way back in in history, that was true. Um, so then you come on to um, a real game changer in this marketplace, which was the 1987 Framingham study. And again, you know, 1987, that just feels like so long ago now. Um, but, you know, what they basically proved in that study, that huge study, was that high, high cholesterol was associated with a higher risk of heart disease, angina, heart attack, and death. Uh, all, all bad stuff. Um, and it took a while for the evidence to begin to accumulate that high blood cholesterol levels were found to correlate directly with risk of death in young men, um, uh, that high levels of HDL were, were found to reduce the risk of death, and that uh, uh, we began to move towards um, uh, producing uh, heart disease risk uh, project prediction models uh, back in 1991. So again, you know, awful long time ago, but um, let's think about really what changed things. What began to change things was that the first statin was launched in 1987. So remember those dates, 1987 for Mevacor, uh, Lovastatin with, with, with Merck. Um, and then in 1988, uh, Zocor, which is probably the most important one for our story today, was, was, was launched by Merck. Uh, launched in 1992 in the, in the US, um, so had a European launch first. Um, importantly for the history lesson as well, 1988 was also the year that the uh, US National Cholesterol Education Program published its first guidelines setting LDL targets 
for various patient risk groups, elderly, kind of uh, those with a previous MI and so forth, and for the first time included a recommendation for statins. So think about it, there weren't many statins around at that point, but uh, they, they, they got themselves onto the, onto the guidelines. Um, so um, uh, in 1989, what was happening internally at Warner Lambert was the animal data shows that the torvastatin, Lipitor, uh, has no efficacy advantage over other statins. So, you know, bad news, right? Which is that, uh, you know, you're preclinical, uh, so you have a molecule, you're in the, in the landscape, you know, think about everyone with an immuno-oncology asset at the moment. Animal data showed no efficacy advantage. Uh, development was nearly stopped. So come to the luck part of the, uh, of the title of this, uh, the, this presentation. An awful amount of serendipity takes place within pharmaceuticals, and I think it's important that we uh, understand that that um, planning for serendipity, which seems an odd thing to be think to uh, you know an odd phraseology, is critical because that's the way that pharma pharma pipelines and pharma development uh, uh, work. A, a laser focused. Uh, uh, lined up uh, development plan is never going to work because you have to take account of uh, accidents along the way. So development was nearly stopped for uh, for, for Lipitor but all the way back in 1989. But because their pipeline was empty, they needed it. The project team themselves felt there was something in there and there was an extreme degree of comfort that if all they would need, if all they ever got from this landscape was 10% market share, that would be enough to pay for the development uh, of, of, of Lipitor from that point onwards. Um, so in 1989, there was no clear target profile. The only thing they had, the only be- reason to believe, was that it was more potent than Mevacor. Not than Zocor, but than the, the, the Mevacor. Um, then something else happened in 1989, which was the Pravacol, the bristol myers Scrib uh, drug was launched. Uh, so the third statin in Europe and the second statin in the US. Um, now, Pravacol is going to be one of those useful um, uh, characters within this story because you've got Zocor, which is launched, and that's by Merck, then you've got Pravacol by Bristol Myers Squibb, and under the radar, all the way back here, you've got this dark horse of, uh, of Pfizer that really no one was thinking about at this point. Um, and um, so let's go back to um, um, uh, uh, 1989 and what was happening at Warner Lambert. So remember we said um, that animal studies have shown that there was no benefit. The interesting thing was in 1989, the early human trials, and let's think about what their early human trials were, 24 Warner Lambert employees were given 10 milligrams of, uh, of, of, of Lipitor in a study and uh, <clears throat> happened to show greater LDL reduction than the competitors, at least numerically, they weren't being uh, uh, compared at that point. So um, 10 milligrams of Lipitor, which will become an important number, uh, gave a 38% LDL decrease. Um, that was at least equal to the competitors' reductions at their maximum doses. So maximum tolerated doses of the competitors uh, equal to uh, 24, uh, equal to the 10 milligrams of, of Lipitor. So um, um, uh, that is important because that really gave them enough belief to go ahead and do some head-to-head studies against the uh, against key competitors across all of the approved uh, dosages to, to take forward. Um, one thing that really, really <coughs> excites me about their development program and the way that they used their phase two was that they did this uh, remarkable study at 80 milligrams. So 10 milligrams as effective as the competitor's maximum doses. The 80 milligram dose was used uh, in a particular study, uh, high in need familial hypercholesterolemia in South Africa uh, uh, within the, 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 the space, tested an 80 milligram dose. All of the competitors at that point had a 40 milligram dose uh, highest level. Um, now, this 25, 29 South African patient um, uh, study became infamous in the, in the, uh, in, in the world because of the, the kind of precision medicine approach that it really took. Um, so, and we'll come back to really the relevance of that. Um, 1994, we carry on, uh, uh, Novartis launched the fourth statin, less potent, but had a lower price, so that was really their, uh, their, their, their desire to, to, to focus. 94, uh, the 4S study, which was one of the most important studies in the, after Framingham, uh, really talked about uh, Zocor reducing uh, death, because this was a, a Zocor study, Simvastatin was one of the S's, uh, reduces death from heart disease and all causes, 
importantly, in people with heart disease and high LDL uh, after five years. So a five-year big you know, mega study uh, to prove outcomes and mortality within a, within a space like this. Um, which led to uh, updated guidelines, so targeting LDL lower than before, you know, the idea of what you had before, because what you had before were, you know, fibrates and a bunch of other uh, approaches to, to, to lowering this, which didn't really um, uh, deliver the kind of effect that people wanted to see, but statins somehow were starting to really change things. Um, and then we come to 1994. So the first presentation of Lipitor's results. So think about those dates. So, you know, some statins had had a long time on the market. Some had a, a few years a head start. Um, so Lipitor comes um, and, you know, it's fifth to market. But the TPP at this point, just to run down this, let's see if I can focus on it for a little while. Highest molecular potency within the HMG CoA class. That was, that was what this class was called uh, before... Um, uh, they were called statins. They chose the class before they chose the molecule. So, you know, again, they decided that they wanted one and went out and found one and, and, and you know, began to, to, to move it forward. Um, let's go back. Greater percentage effect on LDL in the TPP than any other statin at an equivalent dose with equivalent efficacy uh, and safety. Um, and importantly, their TPP, their target product profile, you know, was used usefully because it said it had to have efficacy, had to work within familial hypercholesterolemia. Great. You know, that very narrow definition of efficacy was, was, was employed. Now, um, think carefully about what that means. They weren't using the definition of efficacy as in will prevent death or will prevent outcomes, but what they were hoping to show in terms of efficacy, the redefining of efficacy, was the, uh, that you could reduce LDL in these people who had just huge, you know, uh, threatening levels of, 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 um, uh, of cholesterol, that you were able to reduce it in those people in whom no other statins were able to show that same effect. Other basic stuff, uh, once a day oral, you know, again, most people feel that's the kind of optimal uh, high therapeutic window. And I think about therapeutic window, 10 milligrams to 80 milligrams gives you an awful you know, range of, you know, incredible range of maneuver if you're a prescriber. So, you know, starting and moving up, starting high, moving down, all of that, you know, definition of therapeutic window was important and at the highest level that the safety wasn't inferior to any of the other statins. Um, you know, safety, tolerability, all those things were a part of the conversation and what, and what that means is still being debated. Um, so let's um, come to the final point on here, which uh, let me focus on this bit here. Um, the research that they did for their TPP was only researched with primary care physicians. They never did any research with key opinion leaders at that point because the key opinion leaders would have given them the same old, same old. They agreed that early because that was the only important audience for Lipitor when they went out onto the marketplace. So, you know, again, think about the kind of confidence to, 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 to get something like that done. Um, and then think about what the TPP didn't include. So it didn't include any evidence of outcomes in primary prevention of cardiovascular events or any effect on any parameter other than LDL. They could have shown all kinds of stuff. At this point, what was happening in history was other statins were showing effects on plaque stability, on atherosclerosis, arterial inflammation. You know, there was discussion of things called pleiotropic effects, an awful lot of muddying of the water, stirring stuff up to see where you had a kind of molecular advantage. That wasn't what, uh, what, what they decided to show. Um, and that uh, TPP translated directly to the product positioning, so strength, close up on this again, strength equals high efficacy in the vast majority of patients, simplicity of 10 milligram starting dose and removing price as a potential objection. You know, it's not a well-written positioning, but that kind of, you know, you get an absolute sense of what they were aiming for. High efficacy, you know, LDL reduction uh, in the vast majority of patients, simplicity of a 10 milligram starting dose with ability to escalate and let's remove price as a potential objection. Um, the coolest thing about the story is actually, <coughs> excuse me, the, 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 the regulatory approach. So Warner Lambert, um, just to focus back on this, successfully persuaded the FDA to license Lipitor for primary, primary prevention, primary prevention, not secondary prevention, based on surrogate LDL data only. What happened was they went to the FDA and the FDA said, of course, you've got to do outcome studies because everyone's done that. And they went, yep, 
Everyone's done that. We don't need to do that, right? Um, Zocor and Provacol had done the outcome study showing a clear correlation between LDL reduction and reduction in major cardiac events. Now think about that win. You just saved yourself $300 million. You just saved yourself about two or three years to market um, because you're able to take a convincing argument, demonstration of, uh, of something that you do, a surrogate effect, uh, uh, with a strong belief that it's going to uh, relate to a, uh, this proximal uh, and distal uh, benefit for, for, for LDL. Phenomenally creative uh, regulatory approach that they were able to take. <clears throat> You know, all lined up with this idea that their efficacy that they wanted to talk about was the 30 day rule. You know, lower LDL within 30 days and suddenly you've got a winner. Everyone believes that good stuff happens if you do that. Great. So we'll focus on doing this. Um, at the time, the only forecast only expected to gain 10% of the statin market. You know, big market, 10% uh, was going to be enough. But to target a satisfied but underdeveloped market where potency and efficacy on, on LDL was really the, the focus. And that was believed <clears throat> that that was going to re still repay the investment in the drug and importantly keep the pipeline alive when Warner Lambert had a lean period, uh, losing sales with a bunch of other things. Their forecast six months before launch was $1 billion. Um, in its first year, Lipitor did $2.5 billion. So just think about, again, the accuracy of forecasts within you know, a lot of what we do. Um, in, in 2006, we wrote here, you know, this is before those days, Liverpool was forecast to reach 15 billion. And as you know, it did that durably for, 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 for quite a long time. Um, and just to give you a hint of the transformational effect of a, of, a, of a drug like this, look at that new prescription market share for this kind of brown line of, uh, of, of, of Lipitor over time. Just killed everything else when it came out. Um, so let's look at some of the reasons that uh, that, 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 I ha that happened. Um, the a reminder, you know, uh, didn't show any um, uh, uh, any effects on LDL in the animal models. So the decision to go into man was really based on some cost and development, the need to fill a pipeline and the commitment of a, of a bunch of people that really wanted to take it forward. Um, then some brave Warner Lambert employees uh, t t took on the drug and, and, and showed that it worked. Um, but the, the decision to study 10 to 80 milligram doses was the, the, the need to convince a physician of how safe it would be at the normal doses. So the 80 milligrams was a kind of throwaway. Look, if it works at 80 and it's safe at 80, just think how safe 20 and 10 is going to be. Um, and internally, this was gained a fast track approval. It was, they called this approach the all or nothing strategy. This was a swing for the, for, for the stands, not just a bunt ticket on first base. Now, and again, that takes confidence. You're a fifth to market. Swinging for the for, 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 for the fences is a, is, a, is, a, is a really important thing to do. Then let's think about the marketing strategy. So what they decided to do was to price at a 10% uh, reduction to the major competitors. Um, again, uh, that wasn't to give them necessarily a pricing advantage. It was to remove any price objections to, to, to starting to use um, uh, Lipitor. They uh, uh, built head to head comparative charts approved by the FDA to use from launch. So, um, you know, head to head on price, head to head to, on, uh, on, you know, its effects on LDL. Again, that was the only thing they focused on. And what they committed to, what they began was this huge phase four program to really look at uh, in, in vitro, if you like, LDL reduction versus all of the major competitors. So a, a sweep to prove something that they already knew, which was that Libertor was more effective uh, at lowering LDL at, the, at those doses than any of the major competitors, all based around this idea of potency. You know, potency has never really been a thing in its own right until you turn it into something better like this. Um, and so they initiated a big bunch of phase four studies, you know, small ones, uh, comparative studies, all based on LDL. Again, not forget, you know, forgetting the, the mortality, forgetting the outcomes, but focused on that major thing. Um, the publication plan was phenomenal. They had this uh, publication plan around each of those studies, that they were starting it, that they were doing it, what it looked like, what the, what the results were. Um, and at the time you began to hear this uh, lower is better, how low can you go? Um, uh, phraseology coming around the idea of Lipitor. So lower is better was their kind of core vision, their core positioning for, 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 for Lipitor, reinforcing you know, over and over and over again. 
Um, and one of the reasons that we discuss this as a history lesson is when I say to people how elegant and pure the Lipitor uh, positioning was, lower is better, how low can you go? You know, creating a question in people's minds, but there was only one drug that was ever given, you know, what's the most potent stat in at that, that point? You know, lower is better is only gonna lead to, to, to one win. So as soon as people begin to agree with that proposition, then they're already in your, in your camp. So um, uh, let's just move the clock forward a little bit. So in 1995, um, uh, the FDA granted Zocor a reduction of death risk in patients with heart disease and high cholesterol in, uh, indications. So, you know, timeline's still moving. There's, 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 there's still uh, something open. And in 1995, Zocor became the best-selling statin worldwide. So this accumulation of you know, additional uh, de- label claims uh, was, was, was leading to, 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 to Zocor doing incredibly well. Now, let's come back to Prevacol, our kind of, uh, our, our, our third part of the triangle, if you like. Um, they presented in 1996 um, uh, data similar to 4S, for the Simvastatin study, but for Prevacol. So they, again, got the same, cl- label, same label claim. And their, uh, their own WASCOP study, the big, uh, again, multi-year study, uh, many patients demonstrated benefits in primary prevention. So a lot of what had happened before was that people with, high, um, with heart disease and, ha- and high cholesterol, the secondary prevention market uh, was nice, but the primary prevention market was the place everyone wanted to play. So think about what Zocor and uh, Provacol are doing at this point. They're raising the water for everyone to come later. And as you say, they're creating these kind of outcomes um, uh, that Pfizer, Warner Lambert, was so keen to leverage, not keen to show their own, but keen to leverage. So uh, in July of 1996, the license for, uh, for, for, for Provacol was moved on uh, as well. So, you know, this is the way things looked in 1995. Uh, an awful lot of patients believe to have high cholesterol in the U.S. market. Let's zoom in on this again. Uh, a lot of people believe to have high cholesterol. Uh, uh, some people diagnosed and some people treated with statins. Uh, we'll see this one move over time. Ninety-six, uh, the Warner Lambert um, uh, uh, Pfizer agreement was made. And again, remember Warner Lambert were running out of money, so uh, you know their pipeline needed Pfizer to really hit this. Uh, the, the, the way that it could. So in, um, uh, in 1996, what was happening was an awful lot of kind of, you know, spread the word messages about, um, uh, about cholesterol and about uh, LDL in particular. So Merck spent $41 million just on TV, and I think 1996, you know, 21, 22 years ago, um, $41 million on the USDTC targeting heart disease patients. So already have a, uh, a condition. This is about secondary prevention. BMS taking their primary, primary prevention uh, angle really spent uh, 21 million on, on USDTC alone, focusing on patients without heart disease. So primary, primary prevention. So lots of water raised being raised across the, across the, 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 the field for all of these. Um, um, the Merck physician uh, promotion focused on Zocor's greater LDL lowering than Provacol. Uh, so in 1996, uh, let's go back, you know, uh, Zocor US sales grew 76% and Provacol US sales grew 40%. Now, the difference between physician and, and patient promotion will become very relevant as we, as we go on. Um, but 1996 is a key year because in 1996, uh, the FDA uh, approved Lipitor, uh, indicated for, and I'll stay on this for a while, uh, um, uh, lowering total LDL. Uh, and lowering total cholesterol, like all of the existing statins. They also got lowering of triglycerides, which was unique, but again, part of the same potency story. Um, uniquely, because of this South African study, they got the, um, uh, the rare hyperlipidemic genetic diseases indication. That was the reason for their fast track, that, you know, used as part of the leverage. They had no indication for heart disease reduction wouldn't be available for another seven years within their story. You know, just, just think about that. So they're approved to lower LDL. They're not approved to uh, reduce heart disease uh, in any patients at that point. Um, within the label as well was the, the, the data on the uh, prescribing information showing the 10 milligram starting dose was more effective than the starting doses of the competitors included in the label. 
and that they had a maximum dose of 80 milligrams versus the 60 milligram highest dose for anyone else. And then finally on here as well, uh, they had the starting dose of 10% price reduction over Zocor. So taking on the direct competitor and, and saying, look, we're, we're cheaper, so removing that, that price objection. Um, so um, uh, the biggest question was raised in everyone's minds, which is if it's uh, able to do the, um, uh, the, the rare genetic hyperlipidemia patients, where maybe, and it was a unique indication, where maybe only Lipitor would have been good enough as a statin to do that. Um, and then think about the fact that there's an 80 milligram dose in the label and, and therefore must be very safe at 10. Um, but think about what their label was comfortable to include. Impact on clinical outcomes of differences in lipid altering effects between treatments is not known. But they'd approved, um, uh, you know, the, the, these drugs really based on their LDL effects. They, the, the FDA themselves selves, said there's no evidence that it does anything beyond this. Um, or that this reflect will be relevant. So the motive, well, and let's think about the campaign at this point. 57 million Americans weren't meeting uh, cholesterol targets. Um, 26 million had levels high enough to justify medical treatment, but only 39% of statin users were estimated to reach LDL targets um, on their current uh, medication. So um, things that were began in 96 included um, you know, get your LDL to target as a DTC campaign. So think about the elegance of that. The drugs that are out there are doing a great job, but they're not getting everyone to target. Suddenly you want to start to think about um, really where this works. So the launch positioning of Lipitor, you know, strength equals high efficacy in the vast majority of patients. So this 10 milligrams becomes important and it's a simple starting dose. There's no possible price objection. Lower is better became part of the, uh, the, the fabric of, of really what we talk about. So corresponded, you know, they, the day after Lipitor was approved, um, they hired 500 more reps, 100 more than Lipitor at that point. You know, 2,800 Lipitor reps, a lot, but uh, Zocor went out and hired even more. They increased their DTC spend, you know, 46 million in 1997, 42 million in 1998. Um, huge patient awareness, really 30% patient awareness of Zocor and what it did. Um, and the message was most patients, th their belief was most patients can achieve target with, with Zocor and the Zocor is proven to reduce heart, re reduce heart disease, um, you know, all, all good stuff, but not the most important thing. Then we come on to the protocol response. Their message um, starts to basically be defensive, which is interesting that greater LDL reduction may not be beneficial. Okay, well, you know, they spent your whole time so far saying that it is, but then you're saying, well, actually, there's a sweet spot, really, we're in the sweet spot, and our LDL lowering is sufficient for most patients. If you take it the right way and patients are compliant and you do all the other things that you're supposed to do, that somehow uh, our lowering is, 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 is fine. It's proven to reduce heart disease, unlike a lot of other people, and, oh, by the way, our effectiveness maybe bigger than just the LDL uh, lowering. Um, they started reducing references to lipids. They started focusing on the proven heart disease prevention because their research at that point told them that what people were prescribing statins for was the endpoints, the outcomes, the mortality stuff. Market research, of course, is going to tell you that. And of course, you think about what, what, why this was so um, uh, muddled in terms of its thinking. They start, stop talking about LDL. They started talking about other mechanisms. They start to make it sound like magic that it achieves all of this stuff. But, you know, they threw money at the problem. They spent 67 million in 97, the largest ever uh, for, any, uh, for any medicine, 60 million in 98. And again, but still actually very low uh, patient awareness of, of, of its indication um, or even protocol itself. And the data sheet started to, to catch up. But in 1999, you know, it's still the only statin license for primary and secondary prevention. So, you know, you'd think you'd be the leader in this marketplace. Um, their positioning, essentially, it's the proven therapy, it's a responsible choice, appropriate level of lipid, lipid control post-event, effective, not excessive, inclusion, not exclusion, anyone can take it, and actually there's a bunch of these non-lipid effects that, that you should be uh, really focused on. So um, in terms of the growth in the statin market, you see again this, this kind of rise of the number of people who are diagnosed, the number of people who are treated with statins down here at the, at the, at the bottom, you know, 97 starts to change things, market shares, um, Let's focus in on this. 
you see, you know, Zocor of the two kind of ones that were uh, out there was the big kind of the, 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 the target really, if you like, for, 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 for where to take this, the, this marketplace. Um, and you see that this, these two bars here, a lot fewer Americans in 99 were suddenly getting, you know, uh, undiagnosed or not being treated with statins. We're, we're starting to change the, the, the numbers in here. But again, you start to see the, uh, the market shares change. Look at the effect of Lipitor uh, with it, even within two years from, 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 from when it was launched. You know, just a, just a great launch uh, over here. You know, BMS began to worry that they were that their own data were being hijacked to drive the marketplace. You know, classic you know um, uh, wrong-headed behavior that somehow those other people are cheating. If you like, um, that these are the guys entered the market with little evidence and started to use the wealth of our own evidence to support their advantage. You know, and the words they used internally at BMS at this point were outsmarted and outshouted. Um, remarkable that you would ever want to be uh, uh, described as outsmarted uh, within the space that Lipitor was marketed under the most effective lipid lowering agent, which is true, lower is better, and that uh, Zocor at the time was using this, was really focusing on mortality um, emotionally with Heaven Can Wait as a campaign. Uh, outshouted, they were both um, uh, actually although they said outshouted as if they were somehow spending more, really what BMS concluded at this point was that they were using a consistent message, no wavering from their objectives. Now, we come back to you know why this is so cool within what we've been discussing recently. Consistency of message, getting a, a perfect positioning is the only thing you need to do. It's about establishing a tone instead of noise within the marketplace. So think about it. BMS is using noise, um, of, you know, of, uh, Pfizer and, uh, and Merck both um, really sort of focusing on something else. So let's just go forward a little bit. You think about the way this was um, building, you know, mounting evidence coming from 1970 through, the, that's through 2006 of, of cholesterol and LDL really taking over most of that dialogue. So um, you know, starting to change things. And then you come into um, a, a slide like this again, you know, a slide from 1998, which shows uh, really interesting that the reach of uh, the sort of number of countries that the products were launched and even made a difference that uh, Viagra, Lipitor, you know, two Pfizer products launched globally really for the first time. And it was, most of you won't remember because you're younger than I am, that kind of idea that it used to be used to launch country by country slow. The idea of launching globally was something that really Pfizer was really at the forefront of uh, at that point. Um, and then you look at the kind of sales development and how quickly they achieved their, uh, their, their, their breakthrough. You know, the millions of dollars here for Celebrex and, and, uh, and uh, Lipitor, just phenomenal compared to the way that the market had been this kind of slow, steady <clears throat> progression to, you know, the idea of peak year sales was really built back then, uh, back in the 90s, this idea that you took time and probably five, six, seven years, eight years after launch that you start to achieve your peak. You know, not in their case and certainly not, not anymore. Um, and I'll just focus in on, see if I can really get to, to this. Um, they had spoken to 86,000 physicians before Lipitor was even launched. Um, you know, the, the, from, from dinner meetings with GPs and family physicians, remember the positioning wasn't built on key opinion leaders, it was built on family physicians, PCPs. You know, beautiful, because that's your target audience. Why wouldn't you want to develop the message for them? And the message for them had always come back that, you know, it's nice if a drug achieves better mortality, but getting their numbers down within 30 days, that's the most important thing to me as a, as a family physician. So lower is better and lower is better at, at target within 30 days really made a very, very big difference. Um, so 2001, just to scroll forward, HDL targets were raised, you know, again, handily. Uh, Baycol was removed and there was an awful lot of interesting things happening with Baycol, the, the Bayer statin being removed because of this uh, sort of sometimes fatal rhabdomyolysis. Um, uh, BMS began a different TTC campaign, again, you know, switching campaigns, changing horses mid-campaign. Uh, there was an awful lot of suggestion at this time that Lipitor looked an awful lot like Bay, Bay Coal, you know. Um, reps in those days were able to say things that reps today aren't able to say. Um, but again, look at the kind of growth in this marketplace. The number of uh, undiagnosed, untreated Americans was, uh, you know, in 2001 was reached its kind of nadir. And then the statin market shares and, and look at this number, you know, the 
you know, this is when uh, Libertor really had already taken over the was the dominant statin within the within the marketplace. Um, you scroll forward to um, to two thousand and three, and, and Crestor being launched. You know, um, you know, Crestor had all of that opportunity. It had the ability to really take the uh, you know, take take that market. Um, so this is, <clears throat> and, and again, the the reason to cover all of this is I think it's important to remember the importance of positioning, serendipity, messaging, and execution. You know, we've talked about this a lot. Ignoring the kind of uh, research that most companies would do, which is keep and just tell you you're going to do these studies. Um, all of Pfizer's development program is really focused on a very simple proposition. If we're going to launch this drug, we're going to launch this drug as the most effective drug on LDL. That's our efficacy proposition. All of the rest of that is really supporting a, a message for, for, for really what goes on there. Everything they did from that point onwards, lower is better, how low can you go? And again, I'm old enough to remember being around at the time to uh, execute some of this stuff. Um, the, the, the phase four studies, those things that continue to tell you that you know, head to head versus Zocor, head to head versus everything else. This drug lowers LDL more. The focus on listening to the real emotions of the family physicians who were gonna be prescribing Lipitor, get the numbers down within 30 days, and suddenly we can make a difference. The number of physicians, the number of patients who are getting to target on the current uh, on the current medicine medicines was used as a lever to again reinforce that message. They might have been a target if you'd use Lipitor, for example. All of that, the spend, you know, this this spend that we talked about from BMS, uh, this DTC spend, it was a mess. What they did was they tried to get people to in, to go into the pharmacies and get their numbers measured. Of course, they did that, but the focus that you'd seen on from Zocor and. Uh, uh, and uh, Lipitor on the physician messaging, which is where the best uh, getting the numbers down. So you'd, BMS are driving people in to see the physicians and suddenly they're getting Lipitor scripts at the end of it. Lipitor took a huge uptick in the year that BMS did that. You know, and for BMS in 2000 to say, well, that we've been out shouted mostly because of tone of the messaging, not because of the, the, the amount of volume of, uh, within it was, 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 was phenomenal. Um, so we talk about you know why to think about things early. The decisions that they made to do the hypercholesterolemia study, you know, seem like genius now, um, and uh, that that those those simple stories I think do get lost in in time. So I hope you don't mind me sharing some of my enthusiasm for you know what was a great strategic job uh, for a fifth to market me too to become the dominant player in its marketplace and keep Crestor at bay. You think about Crestor essentially had a better Libertor, messed it up with exactly the same noise uh, in messaging that, uh, that, that, that so many people fall foul to. So um, thanks again for watching. I think I've run over by, by a few minutes, um, but um, I appreciate it. We'll, we'll, we'll move on to some other subjects in time, but uh, I hope, um, uh, again, if you want the slides that I've shown, mygoodideapharma.com, and I will, um, I'll, I'll send those straight to you. So thank you for watching and uh, see you again soon.